Hello and welcome to Talking Music, where every song has a story. My name's Paul and over the next few minutes we're going to get behind the story of a song, come up with some facts and information, some secrets uh, about a well-known song. And today we're featuring this one from The Birds, Mr. Tambourine Man. This is a Bob Dylan song and is found on the Bringing It All Back Home album, uh, Bob had written it on a road trip with some friends from New York to San Francisco. It was never released as a single by Dylan, but it did afford Bob Dylan his only ever US number one when the Birds covered it. The Birds had been coming together as a band through all of 1964. They were a five-piece. Roger McGuinn, who was the lead singer and on lead guitar, he was also the best instrumentalist in the group, there was also Gene Clark on vocals, David Crosby on rhythm guitar and vocals. Chris Hillman was the last to join the band late in the year. He went on to bass, also vocals, and Michael Clark on drums. The band was managed by Jim Dixon, who acquired an acetate disc of the then unreleased Mr. Tambourine Man, and he thought it was absolutely ripe for rearrangement and cover. The band were very influenced by the Beatles, who had swept America this time, we're talking 1964, and went to see the film A Hard Day's Night, and this film really changed their view of what their sound should be. They were to move away from folk and become more Beatlesque. This they would do by using the same instruments as the Fab Four, a Rickenbacker 12-string for McGuinn, a Ludwig drum kit like Ringo used for Clark, and a Gretsch Tennessean guitar for Crosby. Late in 1964, Jim Dixon recruited Chris Hillman to play bass, and then the band was complete. And they changed their name at this point from the Jet Set, which they'd been known by in 64, to the Birds. And they spelt the Birds with a Y, thus copying the Beatles with a deliberate misspelling. And straight away you can see how influential the Beatles were already on the Birds, and also, by the same token, how influential their manager, Jim Dixon, was. But when he got the band to listen to Dylan's version of Mr. Tambourine Man, it didn't really go down well. I just want to show you the, the way we heard it first before okay. we changed it up. Yeah. It sounded like... Well, hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. I'm not sleepy and there's no place I'm going to. Yeah, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me In the jingle jangle morning I'll come following you And David Crosby was in the band. He said, I don't like it, man. <laughs> he said, no, it's that folky two-four time. It's never going to play on the radio. Jim felt that with a rearrangement, this song would be perfect for the birds. He did get resistance, though, but Roger McGuinn said he'd work on it. He'd give it a go. Here is Roger McGuinn and Chris Hillman. So I had an idea. I'd been playing around on my electric 12 with a little... rock like stuff. I thought if I put a bit of that on the front of it and maybe kick it up with a beetle beat, it might come out okay for radio. This is the greatest advice I've ever heard from any, anybody in, in my journey. He said, you guys, you go for substance and depth. He says, you go for something you can be proud of in 30 years to listen to. Don't go for the quick one hit thing. Go for the depth. And he said, listen to this again, which we did. McGuinn, the best musician out of the bunch. Roger McGuinn had been an accompanist to Bobby Darin, to the Chad Mitchell Trio, to the Limelighters. He had produced Judy Collins. He had been around the block. David Crosby had also had a lot of experience. They were three years older than we were. And then that age, when we were in our early, late teens, early 20s, that's a big gap. Roger took that song, and he arranged it. He came up with this. That's a out-of-the-box playbook. If you think of J. Sue Joy of Man's Desire, that's a real line out of a harpsichord Bach piece. But Roger put it where it was danceable. He took it out of 2 4 and 4 4. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. So you could dance to that. And it worked. 
So after this redirection of Mr. Tambourine Man, Jim Dixon thought he had something he could work with, and he took it to Columbia Records. He phoned Miles Davis, the great jazz musician and trumpeter who was also signed to Columbia Records, and he straight out asked Miles to endorse the birds to Columbia boss Goddard Lieberson. Miles Davis had never even met the band. Columbia gave the Birds a one-record deal, a single, because Miles had made the case that this was the music that young people were listening to and buying. And interesting to note, the Birds had never met Miles Davis, and never did, and had Mr. Tambourine Man flopped, well, that could have been the end of a promising career before it ever really started. Here's Chris Hillman again. Jim Dixon, once again. Jim had been so immersed in the jazz scene of the 50s, knew all the jazz players, was in that whole bohemian literary movie crowd, music crowd. He knew Miles Davis. Miles was a huge star on Columbia, also peaking at the top of his game at the time. Jim called Miles Davis up. He says, I need a favor. What do you need? He says, I got a band here. You think you could call uh, the head of Columbia and see if we could get an audition? He says, uh, what kind of band? And Jim said, it's a rock band. He says, do they swing? He says, yeah, they, they do swing. <laughs> and Miles Davis got us a deal, a singles deal. If the single took off, we would get an album. So we had a deal. So they had a deal. But you do get the feeling that Columbia Records only acquiesced to keep one of their star performers, Miles Davis, happy. But they gave the band a young producer, Terry Melcher. He was the son of Doris Day, but he wasn't very high up in the Columbia producer standings and was told, look, see what you can do with this band. If not, don't worry about it. Terry impressed the group, though, working closely with them to get that hit sound with tape delay and compression devices. Uh, say that again. Here we go. Rolling. One. He also made some immediate and bold decisions about who would play on the record because, instrumentally, he thought the birds were not ready to play together. Terry Melcher made the decision to drop four of the members and keep one, that was Roger McGuinn, and bring in some top musicians. Yes, I was the only one they let play on it. Uh, I had about five years' experience as a studio musician by that time, and the other guys hadn't, so... They let me play on it. But I was, it was such a, a wonderful feeling because I was playing with a band they called The Wrecking Crew who played on all the Beach Boys hits, all the Jan and Dean, all the, everything out, coming out of Hollywood. Hal Blaine, and it was uh, Larry Nechtel, Jerry Cole. Leon, Larry Nechtel was with, the, with Bread. With Bread later, yeah. 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 Leon Russell was in this, in this band, yeah. That was a hot Leon record. Russell, yeah. No wonder why it went to number one. Right. The three vocalists on the finished song were Roger McGuinn on guitar and lead vocal, with Gene Clark and David Crosby on vocal harmonies. And when the great man himself, Bob Dylan, heard the finished version of Mr. Tambourine Man, he said, they're doing something new now, and if they don't lose their minds, they'll come up with something really fantastic. In fact, David Crosby remembers the day Bob Dylan heard the song. He came into the studio because he'd heard the birds had done something different to one of his songs. And when he heard the electric sound, David Crosby said, you could hear the gears grinding in his head. It convinced Dylan to go electric and start the whole folk rock movement. How did it fare in the charts, though? Well, let's take a look. In the US, on the Billboard chart, it went to number one on the 26th of June, 1965. 
Number one for just the one week, but it made it. It took seven weeks to get there. It knocked the four tops. I can't help myself off the top. And it was the four tops who were to go back to the top the following week, doing to the birds what the birds did to them the week before. It ended up being number 25 on the year-end chart. It sold a million. It was their first hit in the US, so it turned gold. It was a great start for the band. The best seller of the year that year was Wooly Bully, there at number three at the time, from Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. On the UK singles chart, it was released a few weeks later because it was doing so well in the US. Columbia Records thought, let's give it a go in the UK. And it went to number one on the 24th of July, 1965. It took three weeks to get there, so it was quite a swift rise to the top. Stayed at number one for two weeks. Ended up being the 11th best seller of the year. It sold 300,000 copies in the UK. The best seller that year was Tears Ken Dodd. It sold over a million. There were some big sellers this year in the UK in 1965, among them that Ken Dodd song, of course, but also The Seekers, who had burst onto the scene, and their two hit singles both sold a million. The Carnival is Over, and also I'll Never Find Another You. Mr. Tambourine Man also went to number one in Ireland and South Africa and number two in Canada. So in the countries it was released as a single in, did rather well. The song got a great critical reception. And at the time, much was made of it being the first Dylan song to reach number one in the States and in the UK, even though he wasn't the vocalist. Mr. Tambourine Man inspired the bird sound for the time they were together. And the band's influence can be seen with others that were to come along soon after. Others like Simon and Garfunkel, the Mummers and the Papas, and the Loving Spoonful. Now that's quite an endorsement for a band who'd been down the same route themselves with the Beatles just 12 months before. Some music commentators have suggested that with Rubber's Soul, the Beatles were assimilating the sound of the birds themselves. Rolling Stone ranked Mr. Tambourine Man at number 86 in their 500 Greatest. The Bob Dylan version ran for 5 minutes and 32 seconds. The Birds, in order to get it played on AM radio in America and the UK, had to cut the song down. And they did this brutally by using only one verse, the second verse on the Dylan version, which incidentally had four verses and their song lasted only two minutes and 18 seconds. So job done for the radio. There was speculation the song was about drugs, though Bob Dylan has always denied this. For Roger McGuinn, though, the song's meaning was clear. Meaning, uh, I was doing it as a prayer. I was going, hey God, you know, take me and use me any way you want. Mm -hmm. That was my meaning on it. So Bob Dylan's writing artistry was open to interpretation. He'd like that. And he liked this very much. The Birds and Mr. Tambourine Man. And that's it for another Talking Music, where every song has a story. Thank you for watching this video. Do subscribe to the channel because we have many more videos just like this on some of the world's most famous songs, where we get behind the story of the song and dish up some of the secrets. So please subscribe to the channel. All you need to do is click the button on the video now. And hopefully I'll see you in another video. So till then, keep well and I'll catch you soon. Bye bye.